Welcome back to the lab. Today we're going to kick off a new series that will save this sign from being lame and way too bright. How are we going to transform this box of potential into something awesome? With a little help from my friends, WS2813B LEDs. WS2812Bs, NeoPixels, LEDs, LED tape, serial addressable LEDs, digital LEDs. There are many, many names for what is functionally the same thing. These digital LEDs have really taken a few DIY communities by storm. How tasteful RGB is has become something of a debate, and I'll admit that it's certainly easy to overdo RGB LEDs. Regardless of your thoughts or the opinions on taste, I think that we can all agree that an LED that's able to become any brightness or any color is fantastic. It sounds a lot better than assembling a PCB with bright blue LEDs only to discover that you need dim red ones to fall asleep. During this video, we'll discuss some digital LEDs that are available from World Semi. Well. During this video, we'll discuss some digital LEDs that are available from World Semi. Uh, specifically some key differences between the different parts, including PWM frequency, refresh rate, and redundancy. This isn't the only manufacturer of this type of product or this type of circuit component, but it's one that has become kind of a standard in itself, so it seems like a good enough place to start. Digitally controlled RGB LEDs combine two key elements into one package, an RGB LED controller and an RGB LED. These elements work together to create a pretty awesome part. We'll be focusing on the WS2813B for this example. This part is an upgraded version of the WS2812 integrated LEDs. These LEDs accept the data stream at a rate of 800 kilobits per second. We've represented a group of 24 bits, which is a complete color packet, as one round blob. Those 24-bit chunks of data represent a color where 8 bits determine how much red, green, and blue to show. In reality, this is a steady stream of bits that's flowing through the system, but we're grouping these into 24s, and that's one blob. So every time a new color is received, each properly functioning WS2813B LED does two things. It updates what color to display based on the data received most recently, while forwarding the previously received data to the next LED. The beautiful thing about this system is how it handles, or rather, ignores, some corner cases. We're showing three LEDs for this example. What happens if we would shift out four, five, or 15 LEDs worth of data? Only the last three colors will be shown. What if we shift out only one LED worth of data? Well, only one LED will light up. These WS2813 LEDs don't know, and quite frankly, don't need to know, how long the chain is. All an individual LED needs to know is to continue passing data down the chain, and that's it. The data source generally makes an assumption about how long the chain is. For longer chains, the WS2813's ability to pass data through the backup data input and output is fantastic. For a single LED failure, the WS2813Bs and all the derivatives have at least a dedicated backup data input. Some of them even have a backup data output, which can make the routing a little easier. For WS2813s, the backup data input should be connected to the previous LED, or the B variant, you connect the backup data input to the backup data output. An LED with this feature enabled allows a strip to ride through a single pixel failure, so you can have a single chip fail and the chain will still stay alive. That's fantastic. That's a feature that the WS2812s never supported. Something to consider here is propagation delay especially with longer chains of LEDs. As those chains become long, propagation delay can become significant and ultimately limits the maximum achievable refresh rate for a system. Using that 800 kilobit per second bus, 100 pixels requires 2400 bits, or about three milliseconds to shift down the bus. It seems reasonable to expect that a human eye will pick up on some artifacts as each LED is passing that color data downstream, but uh, there's a sneaky second part of this protocol that comes into play. When you're, whenever you're done shifting out data to your pixels, to these NeoPixels or LEDs, whatever you want to call them, there's a sync pulse when you're done. That functions a lot like an inferred vSync pulse for a VGA monitor, if you're familiar with that. 
there is a 280 microsecond low pulse that commands each LED to show whatever data was last received, to latch that in. Each LED will show its respective color, latch that into a second buffer, clear that buffer, and then waits for the next set of data to be received. So you continue to show the previously latched color while handling the new data. That eliminates all flickering, and that's why I said refresh rate is the limitation for a long chain. It's awesome. Thinking a little bit further, thinking about not just 10 of these, but maybe thousands, there are some key limitations that come into play where every LED has its own driver that's different and they're not matched. Well, if you're mixing LEDs that are from different lots or different reels of parts produced on different days or from a different wafer, it's pretty easy to end up with terrible color matching from one LED to the next, or from one PCBA to another. That means that color calibration becomes essential on a pixel-by-pixel -pixel basis for an implementation of anything like a display. Anything where color accuracy matters. Now, that's not usually a big deal for LED strips used in a house for like accent lighting or for the sign. That's not really a big deal, because if you're not showing more than one strip at a time and you're using parts from the same lot, you probably won't notice. Despite this, a digitally controlled LED is a very effective way to get hundreds of different colors in a system or fading between different colors with a really simple architecture. Comparing this to a system with three analog control lines for every analog RGB LED, an equivalent system would need many more pins on a microcontroller, many resistors for current limiting, and could require some form of multiplexing. It has its own complications and challenges, just like this does. It's a trade-off. Which brings us to the next step of this conversation. World Semi, and the many different parts that they currently sell. Not sponsored, by the way, not affiliated. This just happens to be one manufacturer of, as they say, Intelligent Control LED Integrated Light Sources. I might have picked a different name, but that's what they call them. <laughs> Regardless, World Semi has released a lot of different versions of this part, as you can see. Most of these are just repackaged versions of the same part to give you a different physical form factor with the same electrical characteristics, though there are some improvements from each version to the next. The biggest differences are found between IC versions that can be grouped as WS2812s, WS2813s, and WS2815s. There are a ton of packaging options and reformatted versions that are reflected by adding Bs or B-Bs or a whole lot of like, ordering options at the end, but my understanding is that for LEDs with major functional differences, the model number, the actual number, the WS2812, 13, or 15, those become more evolutionary differences rather than packaging. You can think of it as an update to the old product in a certain way. Some of these variants have improved color accuracy, service life improvements, or a PWM frequency increase. There's also the WS2815, which operates at 12 volts instead of 5, which is a great move because it was way too easy to overload a 5 volt power supply. When each pixel can pull about a quarter of a watt, that adds up to 25 watts or 5 amps when you have only 100 LEDs. For a 12 volt supply, only 2 amps along that same string sounds pretty great. Those reduced currents will limit the DC drop along a strip of LEDs, which is one of many factors that can impact color accuracy for a strip. The WS2815 seems very similar to the WS2813, so I'll just assume those have the same controller and they're tweaked for a different operating voltage. Both have the faster 2000 Hz or 2 kHz PWM frequency, as opposed to 400 Hz in the WS2812 variants. The 13s also have a single pixel failover feature, where the 12s don't. I've put a link to a quick summary spreadsheet where we threw together some of the differences in the description of this video. It's by no means complete, but it's a Good place to start. I do wish that World Semi would publish a document that highlights what are all of the differences, but doesn't seem to be available at this time. As with any component, addressable LEDs are a huge world of parts that reach out much further than World Semi's offerings, but the parts we're discussing today seem to have taken the world by storm, to say the least. And 
that's all great, but uh, what are we going to do with our sign? <laughs> well, before we plan our changes, let's consider how the original one was constructed. This sign uses what's known as total internal refraction, a material property of acrylic where light sent into the edge will bounce around internally instead of leaking out. The awesome thing about this effect is that it's broken wherever a surface coating is applied. That means that if you touch edge-lit acrylic with a finger or apply silk screen or, or a marker, the light trapped inside will make it appear as though light is magically coming out of the plastic. This effect is similar, but not quite the same as how fiber optic cables work. Taking the case apart, it seems like someone took a circuit board with a line of LEDs installed, connected a battery, and that's about it. Removing their circuitry, it seems like there's some extra room inside this enclosure, which is great news for us. This feels like an awesome application for an AT Tiny series processor, paired with an internal oscillator and an already existing WS2813 library. I bet that we can fit a microcontroller with 20 LEDs or so. That should allow for some pretty awesome lighting effects for the system. Our schematic shows a programming header, the LED is connected as we've described, and relies on a 5 volt input. Depending on our preference, we can either use the LiPo management board we've previously designed, or a micro USB port to provide some power. While we're at it, I also snuck in a pass-through connector so multiple rigid strips can be connected in series, or we can just choose to throw one in my computer case for my PC to control. This has become something like an open standard, so these strips should work anywhere. Now all we have to do is lay out a board with these LEDs aligned with the acrylic edge, program the microcontroller, and we should be off to the races. Make sure to check out the schematic, which is linked in the description of this video. If you like this video and can't wait to see the project lit up, let me know by getting subscribed, hitting that like button, and leaving a comment down below. A special thanks to our channel members on Patreon and YouTube. I really appreciate the extra step you've taken to support us directly. Thank you. We'll build and test this PCB in our next video, and I can't wait. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for watching EE for everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye!